Usaka sakabo miyari kena manawa to part eight of the read aloud of caciques and semi idols, the web spun by Taino rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. In the last video, we stopped at part B of chapter 18, which is where we'll be picking up from today. So part B is across borders between Puerto Rico and the Windward Islands. Contributors to the edited volume, Late Ceramic Age Societies in the Eastern Caribbean, have noted that during the earlier pre-Columbian period between about 400 BC and AD 1200 or 1300, there were numerous close affinities and sustained contacts between the northeastern Leeward Islands and Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. From AD 800 to AD 1200 or 1300, a period of growth was experienced almost everywhere in the Caribbean. This period was marked by very close correspondences of Alenin osteonoid material cultures between Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, but also extended south to the northeastern Lesser Antilles. However, Samuel Wilson observed that, quote, in later prehistory, by around AD 1300, it seems that an antagonistic relationship developed between the peoples of the Windward Islands and Puerto Rico, end quote. He postulates, based on various lines of evidence, the existence of a buffer zone ranging from Saba east to Nevis and quite probably also extending further south and east to include Montserrat and Antigua. Wilson, however, is careful to know that the buffer zone was not totally, but only relatively depopulated, quote, because people were probably going there to exploit particular resources and there were likely temporary settlements, end quote. He correctly points out that the ethno-historical record for this region starting in 1493 and through the 16th century is difficult to interpret. Despite the broad cultural differences developing on either side of the postulated buffer zone, a few three-pointed stones of the large variety and shell guaisas have been recovered in the Lesser Antilles. Wilson further hypothesized that perhaps the breakdown of relations on either side of the buffer zone correlates with the rise of political centralization, such as casigasos or chiefdoms, in that island group. Although I do not see the kind of political centralization for Puerto Rico that Wilson assumes, certainly not in the earlier periods, which is AD 600 to 1100, it is still plausible that competitive peer polities did consolidate around AD 1100 and matured by AD 1300, coincidental with the proliferation of Capa, Esperanza, and Magan's Bay, Salt River II, which are Chican osteonoid styles in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Farther west, across the Mona Passage in Hispaniola, it's safe to assume that there was a greater degree of political centralization than in Puerto Rico, and probably paramount chiefdoms were present there by A.D. 1300, if not earlier. I would agree with Wilson that by A.D. 1300, and certainly by early Spanish contact, the center of gravity in politics and demographics though I would not include, quote, cultural, end quote, in the greater Antilles had shifted to Hispaniola. The interregional situation between A.D. 1300 and the early 1500s in the northeastern Caribbean is imperfectly understood. Nevertheless, as Wilson suggested, there is evidence of a, quote, interest, end quote, by the natives of Hispaniola and Puerto Rico on the northernmost border of this frontier land, Chican osteonoid materials in the Leeward Islands have been found at a limited number of sites as complexes rather than as isolated finds embedded in the local cultural complexes belonging to the Suezin or Tromusin, Tromasin, Tromasoid series. These sites are Kelby's Ridge 2 on Saba, Sandy Hill on Anguilla, and Valle Rouge in St. Martin, all located within the proposed buffer zone and within the broader sphere of interaction with Dainoan societies in the Greater Antilles. The Kelby's Ridge II site on Saba, which was around AD 1400s, however, did not yield guaisas or large decorated three-pointed stones, but it did yield one small coral three-pointer, plus a small marine shell cojoba inhaler carved in the form of a fish, an unusual depiction to be found in Caribbean inhalers. 
The limited number of guaisas recovered from the Lesser Antilles are all made of shell and bear decorative motifs that are consonant with specimens from the Greater Antilles, especially Cuba and Hispaniola. A total of 11 samples are distributed as follows. In Anguilla, there are two specimens from the Rendezvous Bay and Sandy Hill sites. In Antigua, three specimens are reported, of which only one is known to be from the Indian Creek site, reported respectively by Fred Olson and Douglas Bird. In Montserrat, one specimen of unknown provenience was reported, also by Olson. At La Desirade, a small island off the southeast coast of Guadalupe, three Guaysa shell specimens were recovered from the sites of Morn Sibele, and Morn Soflur. The first site has one calibrated date of AD 1440 to 1460. The second site is regarded as contemporaneous with Morn Sibele. Another shell guaisa was found on Marie Gallant, just south of Guadalupe. The ceramic assemblages associated with Morn Sibele and Morn Soflur, quote, seem to have no stylistic counterparts, bar some minor style elements which look like suazin, end quote, pottery. Three other Guaisa specimens remain. One was found by Ripley and Adelaide Bullen on St. Lucia in 1970 at the site of La Vote. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing all these words right, so apologies. Um, this site's ceramic assemblages relate to the trauma... Tramasoid series, circa 8800 to 1400. The specimen was collected from the surface. Interestingly, this guaisa was damaged and showed burn marks, but whether this was intentional, perhaps a ritual killing or desecration, or accidental cannot be determined. On the grenadines at Union Island and Il de Ronde, respectively, two shell guaisas have been reported. Of all these sites, only the shell guaisas from Rendezvous Bay and Sandy Hill and Anguilla are associated with a Chican or Taino component. That is, with social groups whose, whose material culture and historical ancestry strongly display taino -ness. In any event, even if they are rare, guaisas have a very broad distribution throughout the Lesser Antilles and are embedded in cultural matrices that are clearly different, i.e. traumasoid. The obvious question to ask is, why Guaisas in particular? Why not other kinds of numinous, prestigious icons? I shall return to this question shortly. The presence of three-pointed stones in some of the Windward Islands, regardless of how they got there, be it locally made, imitations, war booty, exchange, etc., is more understandable since the, quote, faceless, end quote, or undecorated miniature three-pointers go way back in time to the Saladoid and possibly even pre-Airwalk periods in the Lesser Antilles and Puerto Rico and continue to be in production in post-Saladoid times. For the later traumasoid populations, the numinous attributions of triangular objects would be familiar to them. South of the Virgin Islands, the large three-pointed stones provided with quote, faces, end quote, i.e. visually coded identities, have been found in Anguilla, Guadalupe, Dominica, and Cariacao of the Grenadines Archipelago. These larger decorated specimens raise questions about whether they were locally made imitations or brought from abroad, and if so, under what circumstances? Alien alliances and exchange? Raid booty? The earlier component at the Sandy Hill site in Anguilla yielded a ceramic assemblage comparable to the late Elenin osteonoid complexes found in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And it is in this context, with the date of AD 1070, that one shell guaisa was found, displaying, displaying Tainoan iconography. Two other surface fragments recovered before John Croc's excavation was conducted may well date to the last Chican osteonoid phase. The latter two were described as, quote, shell masks, end quote, and may relate to the later Chican osteonoid component. The temporal and cultural affiliations of the shell guaisa found at the rendezvous site, however, remain uncertain, but could date anywhere between A.D. 900 or 1000 to A.D. 1400 or 1500. At the Taino in sight of the Sandy Hill site in Anguilla, circa A.D. 1200 or between 13 and 1500, 
The Guaisa is further complemented by the presence of four larger decorated three-pointed stones, albeit none quite as richly decorated as those commonly found in Puerto Rico and on the Virgin Islands. All of the three-pointed stones are made of igneous porphyry. Since Anguilla is a limestone coralliferous island, all four semis had to be imported from islands with porphyry resources. At this juncture, it's not known if Sandy Hill includes porphyry debitage that would suggest local manufacture. However, I'm willing to bet that these were imported as finished products and that the most likely source would be somewhere between Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. The presence of the Guaisas at Sandy Hill would suggest that local leaders had been engaged in a Guaisa exchange network. More specifically, whether this particular sample represented a gift received from another cacique or was instead his or her guaisa, it will also retain the potential for being given to a foreign cacique in, say, Puerto Rico, and hence for distribution and extending his or her living soul and power to foreigners or strangers. If one thinks of this guaisa as an uttered word rather than an object, the anguillas, quote, big man, end quote, or cacique as John Croc would prefer, was speaking a language that was well understood in Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and more so in Hispaniola and Eastern Cuba, where shell guaisas are even more prevalent. If it was a gift from, say, allied chiefs in Puerto Rico or Hispaniola, the receiver of the guaisa would hence share in the extended person and identity of the giver. If it was his own, or not yet given, then he or she would display the capability to potentially extend his or her living soul to other chiefs, or perhaps even to ritually exchange names and maybe arrange a few marriages. The presence of exotic porphyry three-pointed stones further strengthens the notion that these semi-imbued objects were circulating along with these guaisas as part of an inter-insular exchange system designed to create alliance networks between caciques. That guaisas are present in Chican osteanoid or Taino insights is to be expected, but what of the others found to the south in clearly non-Chican non or traumasoid sites? Here, the explanations can be varied. If, as Samuel, as Samuel Wilson argues, there were antagonistic bellicose relationships between the inhabitants of the Windward Islands and those to the north of the buffer zone after AD 1300 or 1400, especially Puerto Rico to the Virgin Islands, then they would very well have been captured as war booty and appropriated by the victorious war leaders, much in the same way that rival caciques of Hispaniola stole prized semi-idols from one another. But politics being politics, some guaisas may also reflect the reinstatement of peace treaties. As already noted earlier, this is exactly what happened after Columbus's men attacked the, the Ciguayo natives in Puerto de las Flechas in Samaná, Hispaniola. The overture of the Ciguayo chief towards some form of peace agreement with Columbus was to send a guaisa gift. On the other hand, some of the guaisas could well be the result of mimicry of emulating the symbols of power of foreign potentially enemy chiefs in the Greater Antilles. Besides the four specimens from Anguilla, large three-pointed semis have thus far been found in the Lesser Antilles, south of the, south of the proposed buffer zone, at the Anse a la Gord site on Guadalupe, at the Soufriere site on Dominica, and at the Grand Bay site on Curacao the southernmost spread of these relatively large three-pointed semi-idols. Although present, these large three-pointers are very few in number. The samples from Guadalupe, Dominica, and Caricao, however, are as large as many in the Greater Antilles, between 23 and 30 centimeters long. Both the Dominica and Caricao samples are decorated as well. It's because these large icons are so rare that one may discount that they were the result of a local development or toward a larger size, in parallel to what occurred in Southeast Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. The simplest explanation is that the windward specimens were brought from the latter region. Again, the same explanations given for Guaisas can be proposed for the presence in these islands of the large three-pointed stone semis. They would be war booty, or the result of peace negotiations, however temporary, or mimicry. Most fascinating is the fact that the specimens from Guadalupe shows evidence of decapitation. The head portion where the, quote, face, end quote, was carved is missing, a theme that has resonance in the Greater Antilles, too. If this idol was captured in war, then the decapitation probably was a way to ritually kill the enemy's potent semi-icon. 
but others such as the Dominica and the Cariacao Island specimens are complete, which suggests that if these were also captured in battle from, say, Puerto Rico, they were added to the numinous icons of the local leaders. After all, the small, faceless, undecorated three-pointed icons still held a religious significance that went back to Saladoy times. An adequate analysis of the ethnohistoric data from the 15 to 1650s for the Lesser Antilles to provide a framework in which to discuss the circulation of these rare semi-objects is beyond the scope of this book. It would require engaging in a long discussion to disentangle the many notions ascribed to the term carib and cannibales. I have avoided naming the native societies of the Windward Islands as, quote, carib, end quote, precisely so as not to raise in the reader's mind stereotypes of warlike savage carib versus civilized Taino or Arawak. For those interested in the debates and problems brought about by the Carib label, I suggest consulting the works of Halid Suet Barillo, Peter Hume, and the articles in the volumes in the volume Wolves from the Sea, edited by Neil Whitehead. The most useful compilation of early Spanish documents referring to the so-called Carib raids in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands has been published by Alvaro Huerga. And, of course, one can also obtain valuable information by consulting the standard 16th century Spanish and 17th century French chroniclers. The point is that whatever the ethnicity and languages of the peoples of the Windward Islands, their material cultures show far more differences than similarities with the spectrum of greater Antillean, Taino, and archaeological materials. Groups from Martinique, Guadalupe, and Dominica in particular raided Puerto Rico often during the very early 1500s and continue to do so for several decades. Not all of these raids were led by the so-called Caribs against the Tainos of Puerto Rico. Indeed, some raids were organized by natives of Puerto Rico in alliance with those in St. Croix and the Virgin Islands. It cannot be assumed that this raiding pattern was an unchanging condition that existed unabated since AD 1300, as implied by the proposed buffer zone. No doubt, the interregional political situation was much more complex and variable. However, there is no question that natives were captured from Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and taken to the Windward Islands. Just as I have no doubt, there also were natives fleeing the Spanish conquest in Puerto Rico, seeking asylum in the Lesser Antilles. Perhaps these expatriates even participated in raids against the natives of Puerto Rico, particularly, particularly against those who continued to maintain loyalty to the Spanish. Sued Badillo argued that the natives of Boriquen were fleeing from the conflicts generated by the Spanish conquest and that they had sought and received asylum not just in Guadalupe, but as far south as Trinidad. The implication is that there was some kind of priory relationship or alliance that would obligate the host to undertake such a burden. This emigration began as early as 1511 and continued into the 1520s. There is a document dating to November 9, 1511, where King Charles instructed Lieutenant Governor Serrón and his magistrate Díaz in Puerto Rico with the following, quote, to go and search for the Indians of Boriquen that are under the power of the Caribs in the islands of Dominica, Matinino, i.e. Martinique, Santa Lucia, or St. Lucia, San Vicente, or St. Vincent, La Asuncion, Barbados, and tabaco or tobago bring them and have them as naborias i.e slaves and be served by them as long as you dress them and provide the necessary things as is customary end quote while suez Badillo sees this as evidence that the tainos of borinquen had some sort of priory alliance with lesser antillean natives that secured them asylum others like Louis Allaire and Samuel Wilson interpret that the Indians of Boriquen were taken as war captives by the Lesser Antillean Caribs. What I do not agree with is the argument that all natives from Puerto Rico found in the Windward Islands were captives taken in raids by the so-called Caribs. Some were also genuine refugees who received asylum in the Windward Islands. But even by 1511, the intergroup and interinsular geopolitics of the Caribbean natives had already changed so dramatically because of Spanish interference that it would be naive to consider the later 16th century Spanish and 17th century, 17th century French historical documents as a reflection of the ways in which natives interacted in war and peace in pre-Spanish contact times. 
However, there is also evidence that kidnapping women from Puerto Rico by Lesser Antillean natives was probably a pre-Hispanic practice. On his second voyage, Admiral Columbus reached the island of Guadalupe on November 4, 1493, for the first time. The next day, Columbus sent two boats to the island in order to gain information about its inhabitants and, in particular, directions to take him toward Hispaniola, as he was anxious to reach in the shortest possible time, the 39 Spaniards he'd left at the settlement of La Navidad. The narration that follows was written by Hernando Colón, based on the Admiral's lost diario or journal. For the second voyage and the documents, which have survived, of two witnesses, the learned physician Dr. Diego, Diego Alvarez Chanca and Michel de Cuneo. So this is a quote from uh, Hernando Colón. Each of these boats returned with magnificent young Indians. They agreed that they were not from the island, but from another named Boriqueng, and now named San Juan in Puerto Rico, that the inhabitants of this island, being Guadalupe, were Caribes, and they had captured them in, in their own island, being Borinquen. Shortly thereafter, when the boats returned to pick up some Christians who remained behind, they, the mariners, found with them six women that had come to them running away from the Caribes, and it was their will to embark on the Spanish ships. But the admiral, to appease the people of that island, did not want to detain them in the ships. Instead, he gave them, the women of Boriquen, some glass beads and bells, and had them taken to shore against their will. After landing, the Caribes, in full view of the Christians, took away everything that the admiral had given them. Later, when the boats returned to stock up with drinking water and firewood, the said women returned to beg the mariners to take them to the ships, saying with signals that the people of the island were men-eaters and that they had them for slaves. This incident suggests that the women from Boriquen were kept against their will on Guadalupe and that they fervently wished to be returned to their homeland. A raid to capture women on Puerto Rico at the early date earlier than 1493, took place before the Spanish conquest and slave raid armadas had time to radically alter the political scene in the Windward Islands. Therefore, Wilson has a valid point in suggesting that the pattern of raids from Guadalupe to Puerto Rico go back to pre-Columbian times. At one point, I wondered if the women were forced by their kinsmen in Puerto Rico to marry natives from Guadalupe so as to establish far-flung alliances, which would explain the presence of Guaisas and the few other Chican osteonoid religious icons found in the Windward Islands. I imagine that alone, and without the close support of their relatives, the plight of these women to be returned home made sense. Although I'm no longer convinced of this argument, it ought to be kept subliminally in mind if only because politics is politics. Relations of belligerence, such as raids, kidnappings, thefts, versus alliance and peace, such as with Guatial rituals and bridegroom exchanges or trade, can shift quickly and dramatically. In conclusion, what seems to become clearer in examining the Lesser Antillean data is that some of the social dynamics that explain the distribution of Guaisas and large three-pointers echoes that already discussed for the core areas between the southeastern Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, the gift of Guaisas to foreign or stranger caciques, and the circulation of three-pointers to cement alliances among leaders, and its opposite, the theft or capture of semi-icons, Guaisas, and women by raiding rival groups. The issue of mimicry or emulation by lesser Antillean leaders, particularly involving Guaisas, cannot be discounted. The Guaisas and three-pointed semis examined in this section illustrate the complexities archaeologists are faced with in attempting to flesh out details of the entangled web of political economic relations, especially when examining and contrasting the Greater Antilles with the Lesser Antilles. The role of these artifacts as symbols of power but that translate into effective power relations can best be assessed if one attempts to understand what each set of artifacts may have meant in the context of different kinds of transactions between individuals or groups. Although context in archaeological excavations is very important, it's only a small part of the story as all it can provide is the very last context on what was probably for the object and the peoples handling it a more complex history of interaction and circulation. What happened to the Guaisas, or the three-pointed semi-imbued icons, parallels that of other kinds of power relations, such as exchanging names or brides between caciques, or as targets for theft or kidnapping, even decapitation. The possible decapitation of the Guadalupe three-pointer suggests the importance that faces, heads, and skulls had for both greater and lesser Antillean societies. 
Understanding the significance of the circulation of the potent three-pointed semis and guaisas rather than just economic goods is particularly important because these are the objects where political power and prestige, centered on semiism, focused. Their presence or absence can tell us a great deal about the natives' participation, exclusion, or meddling with Tainones. These objects inform us about how natives dealt with those symbols of power and of Tainones. Part five of this book will return to the Greater Antilles to analyze the role of semi-icons in the context of war and battles between native caciques and Spaniards, between semiism and Christianity. The, the analysis leads to two distinct results, one of belligerent native resistance against Catholic Spanish hegemony, the other of the first step towards transculturation and secretism that would gradually result in the various constructions of the quote ethnic end quote category of Indio through the Spanish colonial period and even into the 20th century. Part five is thus about the issues of resistance versus compliance, rejection versus acceptance, and about the very early processes of syncretism or anti-syncretism that largely unfolded in a very brief period between AD 1503 and 1511. These historic events, the battles for and against the rule of the Semis, laid the foundation for the identities of the Indios that began to form and that continue to evolve and struggle for the next 500 years in the Hispanic-speaking Caribbean. And the next couple of pages are going to be uh, figures or depictions of the different things that have been discussed thus far. So this one, I'm going to try and scroll super slowly. Y'all go ahead and pause so you can fully absorb these images for those of you who can see them. All right, so now we get to the description of this figure, which is figure 19, and it reads, elbow stones from Puerto Rico. The, the lithic elbow was tied up by A, rope or henking, or vegetable fiber, or B, bent wood to make a composite, quote, collar, end quote. C is the groove or channel of an elbow stone for attaching wood. D is an elbow stone with an anthropomorphic head carved on its panel. And then fig the, the image E is an elbow stone with simpler decoration. A wider color area is a reconstruction. And the specimens are from Museo de Historia, Antropología y Arte, um, from the Universidad de Puerto Rico. All right, let's go to the next page, which hopefully won't scroll too fast. Again, you guys can go ahead and pause here to get a real good look at the images uh, for those of you who are not visually impaired. And then this is figure 20 stone collars from Puerto Rico. So A through D are massive bench type stone collars with headless fish motifs. E is a slender frame type stone collar. And then F through G are a decorated bench types, bench type stone collar from Barrio Marin Patillas in Puerto Rico. So specimens D through E um, came from the Fundación Arqueológica Antropológica y Historica de Puerto Rico, which is now defunct. And then specimen F through G are courtesy of Jaime and Arelis Pagan. Not to sound like a broken record, but pause here to get a good look at these images, which are of slender stone collars in Puerto Rico. And it looks like it's just shots from different angles. And the description reads as follows. Figure 21, slender stone collars from Puerto Rico. A is the view of the upper panel showing two pairs of opposing persons. B is the lateral right panel showing a bicephalous creature with a single body with crossed arms, legs, and abdomen. C is the frontal view of the notch or prominence. D is the lower lateral left panel, one of the four personages of the upper panel viewed from the top or E and viewed laterally in F. Uh, the white chalk to fill in the grooves was added to enhance the design. And this is also from the now defunct Fundación Arqueológica, Antropológica y Histórica de Puerto Rico. 
And we have more images. Sorry, I'm taking it all in. My bad for the silence there. But um, figure 22 would be two slender stone collars and, quote, attached, and quote, three-pointer from Puerto Rico. A is a detail of the upper decorated panel of the stone collar. B. B is the stone collar with segmented names. And then it's got a B with like a little apostrophe which was referenced in a which is the lateral undecorated panel where a three-pointer stone is theorized to be tied to the collar c is the decorated lateral panel of a different stone collar showing abdominal circle and folded arms and legs again from the now defunct fundacion arqueológica antropológica y histórica de puerto rico And now we have stone color lower panel decorative modes, as you can or maybe can't see in the image. And it shows simple and double twins and the central figure as well. So figure 23 is described as follows. We have stone colors from Puerto Rico, A through H, showing two series, which A and B, or chains of design modes. A, 1 through 4, and B, 1 through 7. Depicted on the lower panels of stone collars. The simple twin personages mode, which is depicted in K, viewed from a lateral perspective, and then the double twin personages viewed from a lateral perspective, depicted in um, images J and L. The compound bat-winged personage, depicted in M, as a central figure with two eyes and a triangular nose in the upper decorated panel and wings folded in the lateral or side perspective. Rotation of one half of the twin personage into vertical position, i.e. profile, reveals it in a kneeling position. Um, and this is depicted in M with like a little apostrophe. Rotation of the upper panel with the simple twin personages in lateral perspective with the base of the collar at the bottom in N in vertical for O and in inter inverted positions um, depicted in P. So central figure of a bat personage in the upper panel in lateral view and in inverted position for Q and then R is another bat personage on the lateral lower panel. And I don't even need to read this. I know this is the cotton semi. So figure 24 is a 75 centimeter tall male cotton semi-idol from a cave site in Maniel Barahona in southwestern Dominican Republic. X-ray images revealed the frontal segment of a human skull in the head area, teeth visible, and an unidentified opaque object in the thorax abdomen area. And this is from the Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography of Turin, Italy. So go ahead and pause here if you want to see this top section. I'm going to go ahead and scroll to the bottom and, and eventually <laughs> read what the figure description is. So figure 25, uh, which is what we just got done scrolling past, is the Macoris type stone head semis from Puerto Rico, A through C, and Hispaniola in D through G. The skeletal figures are noticeable in all examples. Specimens A and C are made of limestone. The rest are of various kinds of igneous rocks. All are anthropomorphic except specimen B, which shows a nose motif reminiscent of a leaf nose bat. The Hispaniolan example, D through G, shows fronto-occipital cranial deformation. The underside of the specimen E shows a dimpled base and also grinding, use wear, marks. So this is from Museo de Historia, Antropología y Arte from the University of Puerto Rico. And this one is sideways. And... So it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to read, I'm not going to lie, but the title is Chiefdoms of Regions of Hispaniola from 1492. It shows Envasaline um, and the La Navidad area in a smaller uh, P 
picture within the larger map. And it says, uh, figure 26 of the chiefdoms and region of Hispaniola in 1492. And I'm just going to go ahead and read it from the book, which is a much easier to turn sideways. But um, it says, In se cacique Guacanagari ruled over the small polity of Marien, where Columbus established La Navidad Fortress after the Santa Maria sank. And this is marked by an X in that... Um, top left smaller image within the map depicted and uh here we, we see um or maybe you don't see apologies that's a bad habit anyway um here are some guaisas and it looks like also um a petroglyph depicted from cuba hispaniola and puerto rico so figure 27 is uh, a sample of chiquinguaisas or face masks. Specimens made of shell from Cuba, A through E, Hispaniola, F through L, and Antigua, S. The Puerto Rican samples are more commonly made of stone, M through N, and less frequently of shell depicted in O. So some were used as a plaque attached to a headband, as a pectoral pendant attached to a necklace, or as an armband. The central monolith of the main plaza of Caguana in Puerto Rico, depicted in R, displays an anthropomorphic head of a cacique with a guaisa resting on the chest. The stone pendant from Hispaniola in P shows a guaisa worn as an armband or arrow. Specimens O through P came from the Museo de Historia, Antropología y Arte, um, the University of Puerto Rico, and then A through E, courtesy of R. Valcarcel Rojas then F through L from the Museo del Hombre Dominicano, and E was courtesy of M. Hoogland. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And great, another sideways map. So I'm gonna just slowly scroll through the whole map and you guys can pause where and as necessary to be able to read the different parts on the map for those who can but um figure 28 reads map of cuba showing the location of key archaeological sites and the first spanish settlements the area of tainoan influence is shown in shades of gray the darker the shade the stronger the degree of tainoness so on the map the the main points anyway is that on the western side where the guanajata bayes are um labeled to have lived is more white and then as you go east on the island the shade gets darker and darker until you get the darkest shade of gray on the eastern side of cuba moving right along to the next image oh i went too fast i'm so sorry all right so this is these images here are from Banes region in Cuba. And it's figure 29 reads semi icons from the region of Banes in eastern Cuba. A is a rare miniature decorated three pointed stone. B is an anthropomorphic stone pendant in the standard knee bent pose. C is a manatee bone vomiting spatula with anthropomorphic head. D is described as a necklace shell pendant with a three-pointed shape with birds reminiscent of the ancient La Hueca vulture pendants. E is described as a shell button with dual inverted bird motifs, a design present also in the iconography of Batey monoliths in Puerto Rico. Last but not least, we have F described as a truncated three-pointed stone semi, a type that has been reported for Puerto Rico and Eastern Hispaniola courtesy of R. Valcarcel Rojas. Then the next page, it looks like it's depicting the Caribbean Sea. It shows uh, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Antigua, St. Martin, Barbuda, St. Kitts, Montserrat, Guadalupe, Dominica, Marnique, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Grenadines, Grenada. And then it shows um, the a bit of South America, uh, including Trinidad, Tobago, Barbados, and then it has um, 
the Orinoco Delta uh, labeled. So figure 30, the distribution of guaisas, large three-pointed semis, and taino or chicken osteonoid series, ceramics in the Lesser Antilles. In the 14th century, a buffer zone or frontier land, albeit not entirely depopulated, has developed in the northeastern Leeward Islands. This next uh, image is of Eastern Hispaniola, and it has uh, Caisimu labeled, uh, Higüe, the Mona Passage, and uh, figure 31 is a map of Eastern Hispaniola showing key archeological sites and areas discussed in the text. Then the next figure is a Boriquen in the Caribbean Sea. And there's also um, Islas Virgenes and St. Croix. Then it's got the legend with all the different uh, things depicted in the map. And figure 32 being described as map of the battles for Boriquen in 1509 to 1520. So it has the Spanish, the Spanish settlements from 1508 to 1520 of Caparra, Villa de Tabora in Guanica, and Villa de Sotomayor in San Germán. And then the battles and raids from 1509 to 1520 are listed as follows. Number one, Urayoan drowns Salcedo. Uh, two, Aguerbana attacks C. Sotomayor. Three, Villa Sotomayor burned. Uh, number four is conf confrontation at Yagüeca. Five being the Spanish attack Mabo Domaca, six, the Spanish attack Hayuya, seven, the Spanish attack Orogobis, eight is Caparra sacked and burned, nine, Casica Yuisa attacked by Taino rebels, ten, Caciques Daguao and Humacao attack the Spanish, eleven, Cacique Casimar of Villeque is defeated, and then the last one being twelve is the native, at the native attack of the Salinas or salt field of Abe. And we have yet another sideways image, which is a little distorted actually on this PDF. So it's basically an image of Northeastern Hispaniola uh, based off of, I guess, uh, per the description, Fray Ramon Panes trail. And uh, figure 33 is officially described as Columbus's fortress, fortresses and Fray Ramon Panes trail in Hispaniola from 1494 to 1497. And on the map, there's modern Spanish towns, Columbus's fortresses, and um, the route that Fray Ramon Panes took. And then what's uh, pictured is, like I said, Northeastern Hispaniola, we have the Macorisha Riva, the Ciguayos area, Cibao, and then um, different parts of, um, of Northeastern Hispaniola being labeled, like La Isabela and Puerto Plata um, and Rio San Juan, just to name a few. Now this, again, pause as needed. I'm trying to scroll slowly, slowly, if I can articulate these English words correctly coming out of my mouth. Anyway, so um, it's labeled Los Buchillones, and figure 34 goes on to describe a wooden masculine semi-icon from the Los Buchillones site circa AD 1295 to 1655, north central Cuba. A is the frontal view showing a typical flex pose with hands tightly holding the knees, and then B is a dorsal view showing the vertebral, vertebral column and rib cage, suggesting emaciation and Mugenarian age, or ancestor semi, courtesy of Hago Cooper. And this next page should be the last of the images until we get into part five. So this is figure 35. And the image on the left is a typical frame of a Virgin Mary icon devoid of all the accoutrements from Spain. 
And then the Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre on the right is based on a similar frame, albeit the head portion is said to be made of vegetable material rather than wood. So left is from the collection of Don Ricardo Alegría, Centro de Estudio Avanzado de Puerto Rico y el Caribe Puerto Rico. And on the right is courtesy of Lourdes Dominguez. And like I said, we're on part five now, the battles for the semis in Hispaniola, Boriquen, and Cuba. So scrolling to the next chapter, and it looks like we got to go past a completely blank page to get to chapter 19, Up in Arms, Taino Freedom Fighters in Higüe and Boriquen. This and the next section focus on two, quote, Spanish Taino, end quote, battlefronts and their aftermath, the religious persecution and the destruction of native semi-idols. The scenario of the first two battles was the Higüe region in Hispaniola, a territory that was also designated as Casimu, literally the, quote, nose, end quote, or, quote, beginning, end quote, of the lands in eastern Hispaniola. Sued Badillo, citing the early chronicler Pedro Martín de Angleria, noted that this land was governed by powerful caciques, including Cayacoa, and, after his death, his wife, Inés de Cayacoa, and Cotubanamá. In another publication, Suez Barillo, following Las Casas, highlights Iguanamá as the paramount chiefess of Higüe. The other battlefront opened up a few years later, at the end of 1510, in Puerto Rico, where Cacique Agüebana II led the rebellion of the caciques of Boriquén. From these events, valuable insights can be gained about the interinsular network of relationships between caciques. While the first battles grew as direct responses to the Spanish aggression, they also suggest that the strategies of native warfare used were not all new, but more likely were based on prior warfare experience and military traditions from pre-Hispanic times. From these conflicts, one learns about the relationships between caciques of Higüey and Puerto Rico and as well of the role and function that semi-idols played or might have played during these crises of war. The inferences to be made about the role of the semis as idols and as spirits are, of course, predicated on accepting the arguments I've provided thus far on the personhood and identity of these objects, on the relationships of power they have with human caciques, and on how and why these, along with women giving and taking and name exchanges, circulated and changed hands to cement alliances and to front rival caciques and, of course, the Spanish. This is not a story about the, quote, good, end quote, Tainos against the, quote, evil, end quote, Spaniards. Native chiefs plotted with the Spanish to defeat their sworn cacique enemies. Not all Spaniards were bent on the enslaving and murderous policies of the colonial elite. A minority were against such abuses against the natives, such as Friar Anton de Montesinos, Montesinos's and Bishop Las Casas's public indictments or the initial noble but failed attempt by the Hieronymite order from 1517 to 1519 to avert the ultimate decimation of the natives left in Hispaniola. In the balance, though, the Spanish colonial and exploitative politics, aided by famine and pandemics like smallpox, led to the utter collapse of the natives' weight of life. Although their extermination was not total everywhere, there's no doubt that the human cost was huge. Hundreds of thousands of Caribbean natives died or fled their homelands. No reliable demographic figures exist for the genocide. But in one estimate, the native population in Hispaniola was around 3.77 million inhabitants in 1492. In five years, some 72,600 natives were killed, a ratio of 145 natives killed for every Spaniard of a total population of approximately 500 present in Hispaniola before the Ovando governorship. By 1510, the native population had declined to about 33,500. And in the census for the repartimiento or distribution of Indians taken by Albuquerque, in 1514, 26,344 souls were left to count, although this figure probably excluded the alzados or runaway itinerant groups in the remote corners of Hispaniola. 
Still, such a death toll is roughly on the order of 3.4 million or 86% of the native population with just a dozen years. And it does not yet include the devastating effects of the smallpox pandemic that spread five years later throughout Hispaniola in January 1519. Because the Spanish records are incomplete, Puerto Rican na native demography is essentially unknowable. But again, there is no doubt that the cost in native life was also very high. This is not to argue that Tainos and other native peoples in some areas of Cuba, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and elsewhere did not survive into the late 17th and even into the 19th century and thus did not contribute, along with Spaniards, Africans, and other Amerindians, to the emerging peasant social formation, for example, the Jibaro in Puerto Rico, or that strands of pre-Columbian native genetic materials may have survived in modern populations. It does mean that the demographic collapse represented a severe rupture with the pre-Columbian social, cultural, and linguistic mosaic of the 13th to 15th centuries in the Greater Antilles. Given what's been learned thus far about the role of semi-idols in the political religious life of natives in the Antilles, their persecution and destruction and their eventual syncretic replacement with Virgin Mary icons in some cases, signal the beginning of the end of a mosaic of traditions configuring what I call Tainones that was at least three centuries old, and some elements of it were more than a millennium old. The persecution, indeed the murder, of semi-icons, semi-idols, for a society whose notion of personhood and even identity were individual and partable, and equally applied to human beings, other beings, and things, surely meant that a part of their person had also been, quote, killed, end quote, even when many native human beings managed to survive. Alternatively, the eventual total replacement of native icons for Christian ones, even when the latter may have been initially approached as semis, as we shall see, led to a very different configuration. In places, natives became indios, their sense of tainones, or whichever ethnicity, becoming ever more syncretized. In chronicling the battles of Higüe and Boriqueng, the early Spanish authors and almost all modern writers relegated the role played by semi-idols to obscurity. They instead focused on human beings as the cast of protagonists and antagonists in the conflict and nearly always narrated from a Hispanocentric perspective. They failed to realize, or did not care, that the caciques is con conducting war and deciding on other important political actions required the full engagement of these other partable and individual non-human beings, the semi-idols. What happened or failed to happen throughout the conflicts was predicated not just on the caciques responding to his allies and the Spanish enemies, but also to the semis as idols and as spirits. As the narration of these events unfolds, it will become clearer that the semi-icons were never too far in the background. My task in the following two subsections is to fill in the gaps left, the things that were ignored or not written down by the Spanish chroniclers. Okay, so section A is titled The Battle for Higüe in Hispaniola, A.D. 1503 to 1504. The Higüe was the very last region to be conquered by the Spanish in the late 15th in late 1503. Bishop Las Casas, who was a participant in the first battle, was of two minds in deciding if the Higüe region was a casigazo under the rule of a single paramount chief or, rather, a militarily driven confederation of several peer caciques of which the one named Cotubano or Cotubanama was highlighted because of his prominent role in organizing and leading the military operations. Not just his prominence in battle leadership singled him out, but also his outstanding physique. Las Casas could have very well been describing a Taino version of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Cacique Cotubanama was regarded by Spaniards as one who, quote, era también alto, más esforzado que otros, end quote. And that translate to was also far more authoritative, backed by the force of law, than others. So, Cotubanama, however, appears to have been one lord or cacique among several others, which included the female cacica Iguanama, or Higuanama, and another chiefess named Ines de Cayacoa. Las Casas observed that Cotubanama was, quote, one of the lords and the bravest, for he was the most authoritative among them, and even though his persona announced who he was, his prowess was because of the great personality he had and the authority he represented, end quote. 
Las Casas specifically stated that he was theorizing that Iguanama was probably the, quote, queen, end quote, of the Higüe, and that the others were probably her subordinated caciques. He, in fact, noted that the Spanish generally did not take much care to know the different relative rank positions that caciques had with one another throughout Hispaniola, of which there were three vocative terms to address caciques, each increasing distance and respect. The terms from highest to lowest were matungeri, bahari, and guaucheri. Another term for principal or first lord was guamiquina, our first or principal lord. These three terms of respect, however, do not necessarily translate into a two-level hierarchy of chiefs subordinated to a paramount chief. Writing many years after the events, Las Casas stated that he had the same difficulty as most Spaniards in distinguishing who was subordinated to whom or if these were actually peers rather than subordinates. He recalled that because in, quote, the kingdom of Higüe, there were many señores, especially one named Cotubanama, I will not be able to affirm whether or not the latter was a subject of Queen Higuanama, end quote. This, of course, is far from concluding that Iguanama was necessarily a paramount chiefess, or that Cotubanama was necessarily subordinated to her, or that the latter was paramount in his own right. This ambiguous situation with respect to a purported hierarchy of caciques is closely reminiscent to that described for the neighboring Borigeng, suggesting that there were strong similarities in their respective political structures. For the Spanish, Cotubanama certainly was, quote, paramount, end quote, from a military point of view. It is clear that he was a well-respected chief among several other peers. He lived on a coastal settlement fronting Saona Island, perhaps near Boca del Yuma, maybe at the archaeological site of El Atajadizo, or perhaps on one of the known Boca Chica-affiliated archaeological sites around the La Romana area. The first battle began midway through 1503, just a few months after Francisco de Bo Bobadilla, from 1499 to 1502, was replaced by the Comendador Mayor de Lares, Fray Nicolas, Nicolás de Obando, a lieutenant governor in Hispaniola. A comendador is a knight who belongs to a chivalrous order and whose title is awarded by appointment and not inherited by birthright. Mayor implies high rank, and Lares is the town in Spain where he came from. The summary that follows comes from Las Casas, who, as a participant, provided the most detailed account of this incident and the battles that followed in his Historia de la India. The immediate reason for the first battle was revenge, a peaceful, lively trade of manioc or cassava bread between Santo Domingo and Saona Island existed. The cassava produced on orders of the cacique of Saona was a major source of food that supported the recently established village of Santo Domingo, in effect, the new seat of Spanish government and administration. On one occasion, the Spanish unleashed a, unleashed a mastin or mastiff, a dog train to attack. Onto the unnamed cacique of Saona, who was overseeing the loading of cassava bread made from yuca onto the barges. Las Casas was of the opi opinion, probably correct, that the massive attack was no accident, but that the dog was purposely egged on to kill an act of sheer senseless cruelty. Perhaps Las Casas, paraphrasing Las Casas, the dog bit the cacique's stomach and chewed his entrails, and as the cacique pulled away, the dog pulled the other way with intestines in his mouth. After the cacique died, the Indians took him for burial, quote, dando grito que ponían en el cielo lamentando, end quote, which translates to screaming to heaven and lamenting. The Spanish and the dog fled back to the caravel. Unaware of the incident, in Santo Domingo, Ovando had already ordered another caravel to set sail to scout, whose crew found a new settlement in Puerto Plata on the north of the island. The ship stopped on Saona Island to stock up on cassava, and other products needed for the expedition. Word of the murder of the cacique of Saona had quickly reached Cotubanama on the mainland, across from Saona. It's likely that such news spread like wildfire, reaching not just Cotubanama, but also Iguanama, Ines de Cayacoa, and others. If Iguanama was indeed a paramount chiefess, she may have ordered Cotubanama to lead the revenge party. Alternatively, 
Cotubaramá may have independently decided that he was under the obligation to avenge the dead cacique, perhaps as a result of a more direct alliance, such as a blood relative. Regardless, it was Cotubaramá who led the revenge attack and killed the eight unsuspecting Spanish sailors who landed in Saona. The news of the revenge led by Cotubaramá reached Santo Domingo rapidly. Upon receiving the news, Nicolás de Ovando ordered the Spanish capitanes of each of the three other existing Spanish villages to gear up for arms and to recruit the Indians under their care to join the troops. The battle group, consisting of some 300 troops, including Juan Ponce de León, was put under the overall command of Juan de Esquivel, a caballero, or knight, and the future conqueror of Jamaica. Las Casas was quite certain that the prime motivation for the military expedition was not so much to punish, but because it provided a great opportunity to enslave the Indians from Higüe. By killing the Spanish, the natives had inadvertently provided the Spanish with the legal recourse of guerra justa, just fair war, and hence for, the, for enslaving them. Thus, a greater economic incentive than the usual repartimiento of Indians for labor. While the latter uh, is slavery in disguise, it still entailed rules, guidelines, and obligations emitted through cedulas reales, or royal decrees, regarding the treatment of Indians that, should they be caught breaking them, they could potentially be held accountable, not because of breaking the law, but because it provided a legal recourse for envious or aggrieved Spanish colonists who did not share as much the benefits of a given repartimiento of indigenous labor. Under the guise of, quote, just war, end quote, however, slavery resulted in Indians becoming private property and owners being allowed to do with them as they please. The defeated could be chased in what the lingo of the time recorded as cabalgadas, or horse raids, which could last many years after the battle ended. I will not go into all the cruel details of the battle that ensued when the Spanish reached the Higüey region, but after an initial resistance and indeed acts of enormous individual courage by the native warriors of Higüey, the natives were defeated. Many ran away to the hills, but many of those who were captured were cruelly executed, even by late medieval Spanish standards. Some were hanged, while others on the run, including women and children alike, were corralled and, quote, slain and disemboweled as if they were sheep. End quote. Still others had their hands or feet amputated amid taunts, amid taunts, and others were beheaded or their bodies were cut in half. Some 600 to 700 natives escaped to Saona Island to hide in caves, only to be imprisoned, taken to a large house and knifed to death, and then displayed in the plaza and finally body counted as per orders of Juan de Esquivel, Quote, in this manner, they left that island destroyed and deserted, despite it being our breadbasket, as it was very fertile, end quote. In the end, the señores de los pueblos, that is, the caciques of the settlement, sent messages of surrender to Esquivel, saying, quote, that they did not want to fight anymore and that they would serve them, end quote. Among these caciques, perhaps principally among them was Cotubanamá, who agreed to the demands of surrender. They would prepare a large or great conuco, or garden, of manioc to provide cassava bread and also labor to build the wood fortress near a quote certain Indian settlement end quote close to the coast to house Captain Martin de Villamán and nine other Spaniards who remained behind. The Indian the Indians would attend to the Spaniards' needs and serve them. In exchange, the Spaniards' only offer was that the runaways could return to their villages without fear for their lives. The fortress was, in effect, built in or around what is today San Rafael del Yuma and where later, after the battle, Ponce de Leon would build his stone and mortar house and an estate that was crucial in supporting the initial conquest of Puerto Rico. The fortress settlement would bear the name of Salvaleón del Higüe. Years later, the Spanish would relocate the settlement farther inland and to the north, near the present-day city of Salvaleón, capital of La Altagracia district. The surrender pact was ceremonially sanctioned by a Guatiao ritual between Esquivel and Cotubanamá, a custom that was by now familiar to the Spanish. The way Las Casas wrote it seems to suggest that it was Esquivel who initiated the ritual and, quote, gave Cotubanamá his name, exchanging it for his, being Esquivel, end quote. If so, and not the reverse, it shows how well the Spanish understood and manipulated the power of Guatiao Pax. 
Las Casas goes on to explain, quote, the exchange of names in the common language of this island was called Guatiao, meaning me and the other that exchanged names. And they so named each other. This was held as a great parentesco, meaning fictive kin relation, relationship, and as perpetual friendship and confederation. And so the Indians called the Spanish captain, Cotubanama, and the Señor Cacique, Esquivel. It is thus interesting that the pact cemented by the Guatiao ceremony would also be an act of submission or surrender demanded and expected by the victorious leader, although it's difficult to establish whether this was a Spanish reinterpretation of the ceremony as being an act of submission when traditionally among native chiefs it might have been an act made only between peers and potential allies. As might be anticipated, Miyamang and his nine men provoked the second and much broader battle of Higüe. Las Casas details not only the expected abuses but also hints at the rape of indigenous women being a cause for a renewed rebellion. Cotubanama sacked and burned the fortress, with just one Spaniard escaping to Santo Domingo to raise the alarm. This new battle probably occurred early in 1504. Once again, Nicolás de Obando ordered Esquivel to round up the armies from the three other Spanish villages and also included hundreds of native Indians conscribed from the region of Icayagua, adjacent to Higüey. The Icayagua indigenous troops were men of war and caused much damage among the rebel Higüe Indians. As Suez Badillo noted, there were various native reactions to the Spanish conquest. Some rival caciques sided with the Spanish to gain advantages or a military edge over their traditional competitors, and, quote, many independent caciques saw in the arrival of the Europeans an opportunity to defend themselves against other more expansionist caciques, and either by force or voluntarily they joined the invaders' struggle, end quote. The massacre of the rebel natives this time around was, if anything, much greater than before. Raids to both enslave and kill natives on the run were brutal. The Spanish Icayagua troops forced captive Indians to serve as spies to find the hiding places of the Higüe natives. At one point, Las Casas noted that these captive guides, with a leash on their necks tied to their Spanish masters, were ordered by an unnamed cacique to throw themselves over the cliffs, thus dragging the Spaniards to death with them. Las Casas paints a bleak picture of utter disarray, despair, and desperation as the initial battle turned into raid, persecution, and execution. The natives also learned some lessons from the first battle, such as clearing false pathways on the thick, prickly matorral bush to entice Spanish horsemen into a trap. Other tactics were the traditional smoke messages to relay information and commands and ordering women children and old men out of the settlements into hiding locations, especially along the cliffs that front the coast in many areas of Higüe. But in the end, all of these military tactics were short-lived and unsuccessful. The defeat in this second battle truly marked the end of native-run casigazos in Hispaniola and resulted in the execution of Cotubanama. This is not to say that native resistance, now joined by the increasing black slave population, did not continue through the 16th century. The Spanish accounts, however, focus just on the Spaniards' roles, the battles, the battles, raids, and some confrontations between individuals. They did not witness or record all the ritual and ceremonial preparations for war, and most particularly on the specifics of the rebel troops' chain of command. It's only when one examines the battles of Boriquen that the nature of inter-insular alliances and the relationships between caciques comes to light. It's in Boriquen that the Spanish chroniclers offer insights about the role of ritual and ceremonies in which semis were called upon in preparation of war. Furthermore, the data from Puerto Rico also provides grounds to suggest that the 1511 battle in Boriquen was not meant as an isolated event within the island, but as a broader front that would include, once again, the Higüe. Above all, it provides insights into the nature of the network of caciques through which the semi-icons, as well as other valuables, circulated. Okay, guys, so um, I think we're about at the one hour mark, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here at section B for chapter 19, and this is where we'll start in the next video.